everything there is to know about this sermon that Jesus preached. And if any of you are like, man, I've heard 12 sermons from the Sermon on the Mount. I've got this mastered. I just need to tell you, you should know, you don't. <laughs> like, we have skipped a lot. We have uh, done this a bit quickly and glossed over some great discussions. So I'd encourage you, read the Sermon on the Mount, study it more. And, and I, just, I just want you to listen to everything Jesus wants you to hear. The, the second thing that makes me sad, of course, is that whatever sermon series we do next— will not be the best sermon ever. We've, we've sort of peaked a bit, uh, which is, I guess, disappointing. But anyway, if you were here last week, Jesus talked last week about this incredible idea of not judging people, not judging from a distance, but critiquing and encouraging each other appropriately. And then what we learned last week is when that becomes really hard, we ask, we seek, we knock, we ask for God's help. We learn that we have a good father. We talked about the golden rule, being good to others. And now Jesus comes back today with one of the most controversial ideas in the modern world. Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount with something that our culture finds really offensive. And it's offensive because of this modern spirit, which is all about inclusivism and this idea that everybody makes it to heaven and everyone's ideas about God and salvation and prayer and everyone is right and true. Jesus ends the greatest sermon ever by saying some things that really push back against what most people in our modern world believe. This actually isn't the first time he's done this because the entire sermon, Jesus has been saying things that are very different from most of us might think. He said things like, don't murder. In fact, don't even hate when most people are naturally like, I don't know, murder might be really convenient. And uh, there are some people that I hate. Jesus says, don't murder, don't hate. And then he says, love your enemies. He says, don't be anxious. He says all sorts of things that we wouldn't naturally do. And now at the end of this sermon, he forces us into doing something. He says that there are two roads, there are two different kinds of fruit, there are two foundations, and that everyone picks one of these things. And Jesus says that choosing one path versus another path, it makes a difference. It changes everything, which actually might be the only thing in this sermon that everyone agrees about right? Uh, roads matter. So I, uh, I tend to go to Long Island a lot. I got family and friends there, so we go there a bunch. And uh, what I learned really early on is that there are, from the Hudson Valley, a bunch of different ways to go across the Hudson River, right? You got Bear Mountain, the Tappan Zee, GWB, and, and then you have all sorts of roads like the Palisades, 17, Bear Mountain, whatever. Uh, it, it becomes a little bit of calculus, figuring out how to get to a place. In fact, choosing the ro ro right road all depends. Like, what's the weather like? Is there construction? Are the Yankees playing? Does anybody want to see the Yankees playing? <laughs> like, that, that changes everything. What, what time of day is it? What's the traffic like? Do I go with the flow of traffic, or do I go the speed limit? Uh, do I go in the HOV lane? I mean, there are all sorts of options that seem so simple, but if you've ever made the trip to Long Island, you know that any one of those little variables changes everything. There are many long ways of getting to Long Island. In fact, any one of these really simple decisions will change your trip drastically from being like an hour and a half to like eight hours. It's crazy. Oh, not to mention, just so you know, there are lots of roads they don't all go to the same place. Um, and unless you pick the right road, the right direction, you won't end up in the same spot. Everyone knows this. Uh, I, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but uh, I heard this story about a young driver in our church, and she was trying to drive from, I think it was Florida, New York, which is a couple miles that way. She was on 17 coming to church, and uh, about 45 minutes, she calls her mom and says, uh, Mom, I think I'm almost to church. The sign says, Welcome to Pennsylvania. Is that, is that close to Goshen? And uh, you know this. There are lots of wrong ways to go to places. This is not controversial at all. Everybody knows that picking the right road, going in the right direction, changes your destination. So here's what Jesus said last week. Actually, turn your Bibles with me 
We're in Matthew chapter 7. I'm, I'm just going to read. Uh, I'll start in verse 13. Jesus says this. Enter. All right, I'm just going to stop right there. This is what you should know about what Jesus teaches. Entering is an action. And Jesus says right off the bat, do something. Make a decision. Take a turn. He doesn't say, admire the gate. He doesn't say, I just taught all this stuff. I just did the best sermon ever. Think about it. He doesn't say, ponder the teachings of Jesus. I mean, lots of people admire the teachings of Jesus like you'd admire Shakespeare or a fine painting. Lots of people say Jesus is saying great stuff. They admire his prose, and they don't do a thing about it. And Jesus will not let you do that. Jesus' teaching is not just something to admire and ponder or contemplate. That's not what he says, right? He says, I want you to enter, decide, act, and do. Don't just, don't just listen. You know, those, are, those are the really important and difficult moments in life when you make decisions. And we all make thousands of decisions. What are you going to do today? What do you want to eat? Who are you going to talk to? What are you going to watch? Um, and Jesus comes along and, and says, okay, here's, here's a decision. And he says it in a couple different ways. But this is the most important decision you will ever make in your life. The decision about Jesus. The decision about spiritual things. Uh, the way that you take changes where you go. And the foundation you lay in your life affects what you build on it. And let me just point out at the offset that some of us really shy away from this language of choosing or entering or deciding because when it comes down to it, it it's asking people to do something that they are not capable of doing. And Reformed theology points out what is true, that people are actually really messed up. We're broken. We are completely and totally depraved, and we, we are not humanly capable by ourselves of making the sort of decision that will change your life. You, you can't choose to follow Jesus by yourself, and you could read lots of other scripture about this, but what happens when you choose or you enter or you, you follow Jesus, what happens behind the scenes is that God does a sovereign work in your heart to change you. He calls you to himself before the foundation of the earth was laid. You don't, you don't just wake up one day and decide to enter the narrow way. So lots of Reformed folks go, if that's true, you can't choose God. God chooses you, which is true. Uh, you could read things like Ephesians 1. A lot of folks say, how dare you tell people to choose God if they can't do it? How dare you say, enter through the narrow gate if they can't, uh, as though they're capable of it? In fact, this is probably true. Asking someone to choose or to follow or decide, asking someone to follow Jesus when they're dead in sin is a little bit like going to a funeral, walking through the reception line. You finally get to the front. You stop at the casket and you go boldly, get up, be alive. I mean, you, you can't say stuff like that because you can't make people alive. Who would dare ask someone to do something they can't do? Well, Jesus. Jesus dares say this, and Jesus knows theology. He knows that behind the scenes, uh, in the unseen world, that people who you may see following Jesus, who are entering by the narrow gates, they've, you know, God has already been doing something in their heart. While dead in sin, they've been made alive. Uh, Jesus knows that they've been given grace and repentance, but that doesn't stop Jesus from saying things like, follow me, or enter. And if you decide to follow Jesus, uh, you should know that uh, behind the scene, there's a lot going on. Um, you hear God say, follow me, and you do it. Uh, but I'm just going to say what Jesus says, without many reservations, enter through the narrow gate. Follow Jesus, build the right foundation, and if you decide to do that today, my disclaimer is that you should know that there is more going on behind the scenes than you're aware of. All right, so I did not get very far in this verse. I'm sorry. Let's keep going. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. 
but small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. You see what Jesus says here? There are basically two ways to go in life. There is a broad, easy way that leads to destruction, Jesus says. And then there's another gate. It's harder, it's more difficult, but it leads to life. And if you, if you read this, there, man, there are all sorts of things in here that are offensive to our culture. Let's just start with this. The narrow gate is narrow, right? I mean, there's one thing Americans don't like, it's narrowness, right? We, we don't like things to be narrow. We don't want to have limited options. We want broad, lots of options. We, we'd like to say that everybody's right, is cool, they're all good, everybody's okay. We would like to say that everybody's concept of God, prayer, and spirituality must be true, and it's, it's sort of impolite to confront someone to tell them they're wrong, but Jesus just comes out unafraid and says, the gate is narrow. This is offensive to so many folks. Let me give you a couple examples of what our culture teaches on this. This is from a book called Case for Christ. It quotes uh, Rabbi Shmuley Botik, and he says, I am absolutely against any religion that says that one faith is superior to another. I don't see how that's anything different from spiritual racism. It's a way of saying that we are closer to God than you are. And that's what leads to hatred. In other words, how dare anybody say that there's a narrow way? That's, that's offensive. Or take, uh, here's John Lennon. He, he said, uh, I believe that Jesus and Mohammed and all the rest, what they all said was right. Or take, uh, here's Oprah Winfrey, who says, one of the greatest mistakes humans make is to believe that there is only one way to God. Actually, there are many ways to God. And I'm not picking on any of these folks. Um, I'm just telling you this is what our wider cultural climate teaches. And Jesus says something here that is on a collision course with our entire culture and worldview. He says, not everybody's right. The way is narrow. And there's not one destination where everybody ends up. There's actually two, life and destruction. This is offensive. And Jesus says this a bunch. Like, take something like what it says in John 14, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. That's what Jesus says. Or take uh, what, what the apostles do in Acts 4. So in Acts 4, the apostles go out preaching what Jesus taught them, and they go out proclaiming that there is no other name under heaven by which people can be saved, except, the apostles say, the name of Jesus. This is, this is really controversial and, and offensive in our culture. What do we do with this? What do we do with this? Jesus says that Christianity is a narrow road and most people miss it. What are we supposed to do in our wide, tolerant, diverse, accepting culture? Let me give you kind of two ideas, and there's, there's a lot we could talk about this. These two are from a guy named Mark Clark. The first thing, let me say this. I think the first thing that church folks need to think when we think about narrow and wide is, I almost don't want to say this, but I think we can actually learn something about resisting narrowness. Um, because I, I think even back then, some of Jesus' audience made the way more narrow than Jesus did. In fact, they made it so narrow that they missed Jesus. So the first thing I want to say is we don't want to be like the Pharisees. There were a group of people who became so narrow that they changed the gospel into a, a list of rules and regulations that reflected their culture to the point where they crucified Jesus. You have to ask, does that happen in churches like ours? Do people start to think that, you know, if, if there are people who don't think like us, look like us, sound like us, dress like us, vote like us, think like us, if people don't fit into all of our narrow categories, I, I, I think there are churches that subtly exclude different people. 
and we somehow imply that they're not good enough. So the first thing I need to say, and I need to say this, the way isn't that narrow. <laughs> it's, and when we reduce the bigness of the gospel to our own cultural preferences, that is not what Jesus is talking about. The gospel is that Jesus rose, he died, he's coming again, it is more than our own cultural preferences. And this actually is something that confuses people. So you should know, I'm just going to say it, that as you are part of this narrow road, entering the narrow gate as you're part of the gospel following Jesus, people traveling with you might be more diverse. Godly people might look more different than most of us are willing to realize. In fact, even in this church, we have lots of different people, folks with different theological styles, different preferences, politics, whatever, and the gospel is broad enough to include a lot of diversity because we all gather around the narrowness of the cross, the gospel, not the narrowness of our culture. And if we try and make everybody look, act, and think the same way as us, like we would actually be changing the gospel and reducing the glory of God. And we might actually get distracted from the good news itself. So the first thing I want to say is, don't be that narrow. The second thing I want to point out is that, let me say this. Another big mistake our culture makes is to confuse cultural pluralism with spiritual pluralism. So cultural pluralism says that we are people, and Jesus talks about this, we love everybody. We love different cultures. We embrace everyone, and it, because in the Sermon on the Mount and in America, everybody has a right to believe what they want, and that's, that's good. We should love and accept our neighbors, our friends, coworkers for where they are. The problem, the dangerous leap that our culture makes is goes, because everybody has a right to believe whatever they want, it must make everything equally true, and that's religious pluralism. The danger is when we confuse the two. We need to have cultural pluralism, which is to embrace everybody, but we cannot have religious or spiritual pluralism because we proclaim a narrow gospel. Let me give you an example of how this works. So when I was in high school, and I was homeschooled, so my only friends were people who lived next to me, and my best friend was my age, loved basketball, he was an immigrant from India, and he was a strict Hindu, which made us a, a weird group of friends. So my father was a pastor of a church. My friend Yu Mang, his dad had little statues in his house and led kind of what I thought were odd religious rituals. And uh, Yu Mang and I were really good friends. We played basketball almost every day. He'd come to our youth group because we had hockey and it was awesome. Um, he'd go to church camp. We went to Word of Life with my friend Yu Mang, and it, it was sad. He actually got picked on by Christians who noticed he was different and didn't understand. But I would stick up for him. He, he, was, he was one of my best friends, and we would sometimes talk about religion, and Yu Mang would talk about reincarnation, and I'd talk about Jesus and resurrection and scripture, and we'd play basketball, then we'd like sit down and catch our breath, and we talk about which way is the right way. And, and we were actually really good friends. We accepted and loved each other, but we never ever agreed about spiritual things because we believed complete opposites. And here's the crazy thing. Yumang and I would never agree to saying that what he said is true and what I said is true at the same time because it just didn't work. Two Mutually exclusive ideas cannot both be true. And we're good friends. We hung out almost every day. And uh, I would stick up for his right to believe whatever he wants, even when he was getting picked on by folks. Um, but we both thought the other person was wrong because each of our beliefs were narrow and, and mutually exclusive. And, and it actually would have been insulting for someone to come in and say, well, it's all the same thing. But what's crazy about our culture is that we want to say that people with mutually exclusive beliefs should all get along, which is good. But we also want to say that we're both right. You're right, I'm right, even if it's the exact opposite. 
And that's the, the mistake we need to avoid. If, if I'm saying that the only way to eternal life is by Jesus, and if my friend Yumang is saying the only way to eternal life is by uh, living a good life or reincarnation or whatever, we, we're not both right. As, as painful as to say, one of us has got to be wrong, and it's not kind, it's actually a disservice and disrespectful to both of us to say that we're all saying the same thing. Um, it's like, okay, this is really sad, but on Friday night when the Yankees lost a divisional game against Cleveland, I mean, can you imagine if after the game, I don't know, uh, Aaron Judge comes up to Jay Bruce and says, wasn't that a great game? We both won. I mean, we, we both are right. Everyone wins. I mean, he'd say, what, what, no, 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 what? We won, you lost. And, and imagine him saying, no, it's great. We're all equally winners. No, no, no. It's, it's not how it works. Not everybody wins. There's winners, there's losers, there's truth, there's not truth, and that is what Jesus is talking about. There is, as offensive as it might sound, there's a narrow way and a wide way. There's life and destruction. It's not bigotry or spiritual racism. It's the way that God's put out for us. Because if Jesus is the way, and if he came down to rescue us while we are still sinners— and if you really believe that Jesus died for us and that by believing in him we have eternal life, then, I mean, yes, we, we should embrace people. We should love them and listen to all sorts of people, even maybe especially people we disagree with. But if Jesus is the only way, it means that the most loving thing we can do is to point people to this gate, to Jesus, as we follow Jesus ourselves. This is one of these massive topics that we could talk about for a really long time, um, and we may talk about this more some other time, but I, I, I've got to finish the Sermon on the Mount today. Um, so here we go. What happens next is Jesus moves on to two applications of what this teaching means. If you should enter the narrow, life-giving way and not wander down the wide, destruction-leading way, what would that mean for you? Let's just keep reading and see what Jesus says. This is Matthew 7, verse 15. Here's what Jesus says. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes? or figs from thistles. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you'll recognize them. Oh, and not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy, prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I... I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. This is actually fascinating because, uh, for starters, Jesus does that thing that he does over and over again in the Sermon on the Mount. What Jesus does over and over again is go, look, for a minute, forget about those people over there. Think about you. He does this over and over again in the Sermon on the Mount. He goes, okay, stop thinking about murderers for a minute. Think about you. Do you hate anybody? That's what Jesus does over and over again. Jesus today says, Enter the narrow way, and everybody in the audience is thinking about everybody else. Jesus must be talking about all those other people, the terrible people, violent Roman pagans, atheists, Cleveland Indian fans, awful people who need to repent <laughs> and go through the narrow gate. And, uh, it, and Jesus switches like he always does. He says, Look, let, let's, let's stop thinking about them. Let's think about you the audience of the Sermon on the Mount. Did you know that there are good religious church, church folks who think that they're okay, 
who think they're going this way, but they're actually going the wrong way and taking people with them. You will find people in pews in America who look good, are dressed right, can say the right things, they know when to stand, know when to sit. They can recite the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed like they're on the radio or something. It's, it's super impressive. There are people who prophesy, which, which means to foretell. There, there are people who talk a good game about religious things. They have strong opinions about churchy sorts of things. And Jesus says, there are people who look like you, who are going down the road of destruction. What? <laughs> because Jesus says, at their very core, they may look right, but they don't actually know Jesus. And they don't have hearts that are changed. And you could tell, Jesus says, if you look closely at what Jesus calls their fruit. And if you want to know what Jesus is talking about in terms of life change, well, just read the Sermon on the Mount again. What Jesus says, and this is incredibly insightful, that not only is the Sermon about the Law prescriptive, in other words, you can read the Sermon on the Mount as a list of things to do, like, you should love your neighbor, check. You should not hate, check. You should not murder, check. You should not uh, lust, check. You should not be prideful, check. I mean, it, it is a list of things to do. But Jesus says that it also is descriptive. In other words, if you're someone who knows Jesus, and if you have a heart that is being changed by God, by the Holy Spirit, then not only is a Sermon on the Mount something that you should do, but it's also a list of what God is doing in you. If God is changing you, if your heart is close to God, you're going to start looking like what the Sermon on the Mount describes. This should describe who you are as a person, someone who has a heart that is bearing good fruit. And what's scary about this passage is if good fruit in no way describes you, you kind of wonder, do I know Jesus? Is my heart being changed by the Holy Spirit? Is there fruit? Are there results in my life that show this? This is one of these really hard passages. I, I kind of wanted to skip, to be really honest with you. Uh, I don't like preaching on everything Jesus says. Some things he says are, are hard. So, but Jesus says this, so we're going to talk about it. Um, just so you know, in our church, this idea comes up in two times at least, when we talk about leaders and when we talk about communion. Whenever we have leaders, elders, deacons, pastors, when, well, before someone becomes what we call an office bearer, you, you may know this, we put out a list in the bulletin of nominees, and what we're doing is we're asking everybody, inspect the fruit. Is this name on the list someone in whom you see good fruit? Is this someone whose talk matches their walk? Or is there rotten fruit that we don't know about because we, we don't spy on people really? Um, but is there anything that would disqualify someone from leading our church? Are there any really hard conversations we need to ask just for clarity? Uh, this also comes at least one more time in the life of this church when we think about communion. Um, the reason why it comes up when we go to the Lord's table is because in 1 Corinthians 11 has some really serious warnings about taking communion the wrong way. You could read it, but in 1 Corinthians 11, people took communion and they're going the wrong way. Their hearts were the wrong place. And this is in the Bible, right? They literally got sick and died, which is terrifying. We as church leaders, we don't want anyone to get sick and die in service. Our insurance company doesn't want this to happen. The people who do coffee break, coffee hour don't want this to happen. It'd be a huge hassle. Um, so what do we do with this? I mean, there, there are some churches that take this practice so seriously that if they don't feel like they can personally inspect all the fruit of your life and say, you know, welcome to church. You're something, you're someone who's living your life well, they, you will not get communion. It seems for us that the Bible and the catechism puts the burden of that inspection not on the person holding the plate, but on the person taking communion. So here's what we do at Goshen Church. We'll, we'll say this in a few minutes. Uh, look at your heart. Look at the fruit of, your, of God working in yourself. You know yourself better than anyone else. 
that people, even who look good, have secret sins. So take a week. We give you a whole week. Confess your sin. Look at your life in the privacy of your heart. And then if God says, you're okay, take communion. And if you're not ready to take communion, if you're not, uh, if you're not a growing Christian repenting from sin, wait. Don't take communion. Um, and if you've ever done this thing, right, if you've actually taken what we ask you to do, reflect on what God is doing in your heart, if you, if you think about the distance between what God has for you to do, uh, you know how hard this is. Because what happens is you, you see who God is. He's holy. He's perfect. And, and then you look at yourself and go, man, I am I'm way down here. God's up here. I'm down here. And maybe Maybe I have a little bit more fruit than last year. Maybe I'm closer to God than I used to be, but I'm, I'm nowhere close. And if that's where you are, scared and humble, that might be okay. Because God draws close to the humble. And for those of us who get completely overwhelmed, frustrated, disappointed by the divide between who we are and where God wants us to be, frustrated, not sure how to change bad habits, how to change practices or sins, Jesus ends with a very simple starting point. Here's how you enter the narrow gate. Here's how you make sure that your heart is in the right place. This is how you can be ready for whatever comes next. I'm going to read this. It's very familiar, um, but think about this. Jesus says, therefore, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice It's like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Did you catch what Jesus said here? For Jesus, the entryway to a changed heart, the entering into the gate, the foundation that will powerfully change however you build your life, that will change how you respond to life's storm. For Jesus, it is, in, it is based on what you as a human being do or don't do. Jesus says there is a life-defining point where you will either, you can see it, hear Jesus' words and put them into practice, or you don't. That's what we just read, right? The thing that changes your life is when you either hear God's words and you do it, or you hear God's word and you don't. And for Jesus, that changes everything. That's the gate. That's the way. That is the foundation of your life. And that's how Jesus ends the best sermon ever. I'll read the last two verses. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. So, Father in heaven, Jesus, I pray that you would show us your word. Could you help us to hear it? Father, help us not just to hear your word, but may we be people who obey your word. May we be people who have foundations that are firm in the middle of life's storms. Could you make us to be stable, when, every, when life just knocks us around, could you give us, by your Spirit, the fruit that comes from knowing you? As we approach the Lord's table, could you, by your Spirit, convict us of our sin and give us the faith and repentance that bring us closer to you? May we, Father in heaven, be people who can stand on you, our rock, And may you wash us with the shed blood of your son, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand and sing a hymn of response. It's found in your hymnal, number 388, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. I'm going to ask you to sing the first three verses and reflect on the foundation upon which we can build our lives. Let's sing together.